Ah, and we are live. Welcome back to Takes by Fans. We got a great show for you today. As always, we are live every single day at noon Eastern. If you want to watch live, head over to twitch.tv slash Takes by Fans. If you want to watch but not live, head over to our YouTube channel, Takes by Fans. We post all of our shows and clips of the show there on a daily basis. And if you just want to listen, we are on podcasting apps, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio. So, however you want to watch or listen, we've got you covered multiple ways. Alrighty, today's a big old Tuesday. Week 5 in the NFL has just officially wrapped up, and holy moly, that's Lamar Jackson for y'all. Holy cow, what a comeback. Down 16 points, needing to get two touchdowns and two two-point conversions, and who do they rely on, baby? Yeah, obviously Lamar Jackson, but Mark Andrews, tight end, university repping big last night. Gotta love it. Yeah, Lamar Jackson's good. Yeah. Yeah, blah, 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 quarterback, who cares, right? We're looking at the tight ends, baby. Sheesh. And we got tight end Tuesday today on our show, giving out grades for all the great tight end performances. And I think what we just saw last night was the best tight end performance of the season, hands down. And do I dare say the best tight end performance in NFL history, folks? Mm, I think so. So we'll break down. Obviously, Mark Andrews in that great game from last night. Break all that uh, Monday Night Football down. But then we will also look at all the other great tight end performances. Uh, like we said, I mean, no, nothing really lived up to what Mark Andrews did, but there was still a, a lot of other great tight end performances that we do have to talk about in grade and, uh, you know, see who is still performing well. I think we've got some new names here at the tight ends. Week five and now tight ends, you know, from other teams in tier two, like second string tight ends are really starting to get into the mix. So, hey, you know, we'll talk about, you know, 100 tight ends every Tuesday. We don't care. Uh, you know, the more tight ends, the better out here. And we've got a couple couple uh, new additions making their first appearance on the summa cum laude tight end list here where we look to uh, crown the best tight end in the NFL. Um, and then Tuesday, now that week five is wrapped up, we have to do our power rankings, folks. Who's moving up? Who's moving down? And we're taking a team right off the list this week, folks. We're done with this team. It's a high-ranked team. It was uh, uh, the fourth best team, in our opinion, heading into this week. But we're done, and we're throwing them right out the window, right in the trash where they belong. This team is trash. Get them out of here. So we got a lot to talk about here today on the show. And uh, before we talk about anything, holy Holy moly, breaking, interrupting news while we were all watching Monday Night Football. We were watching, you know, Lamar Jackson and this Colts team both struggling offensively in the first half. And then Adam Schefter shows up on our screen. Breaking news. The Raiders are parting ways with John Gruden. Oh, my goodness. Did that catch everybody by surprise? We knew the email that was kind of leaked 11 years ago. Um, and then, you know, he, you know, a couple days went by and he wasn't going to get fired or anything like that. So we were like, okay, John Gruden's probably safe. Yeah, the email was bad, but it was, you know, okay, but it was 11 years ago. Maybe he's grown already. But then Adam Schefter was like, <laughs> nah, that was just, that was just uh, a little a flake of the iceberg, a little bit of a, uh, a crumb that broke off of an iceberg because now there's an entire article and emails, thousands, hundreds of thousands of emails that are uh, having that same type of not great language here by John Gruden. So I don't think he was officially fired. He did officially resign. So, you know, he was forced, I'm sure. Uh, but I want to talk about this article. We don't really get that um, that uh, serious here on the show. We don't really go into these kind of very serious allegations and articles. The last one that we really talked about in depth was the Washington football team cheerleading scandal and that whole thing in that front office scandal last year and then brought up again this year that was really the only time we talked about real serious articles right here but we got to talk about this John Gruden one and really see what the heck this man is saying um you know because you know obviously he's coming out and defending himself hey I never meant to hurt anybody but you know yeah I mean you're not going to be you know actively racist to the public I mean he was on Monday Night Football with Mike Tirico and all that you know so obviously he's not you know saying this th saying these things out loud in front of a national audience but I mean you know if you're doing it in emails and private conversations that's probably who you kind of are a little bit 
in person um you know you, like i said you're not going to be actively racist because you know hey you know racist is like the worst thing you could got to be labeled here so i mean people are smart and you know if they are racist they're going to try to hide it especially you know somebody in john gruden's position who is you know um at, at uh, espn a weekly kind of telecast breaking down the game his quarterback camp and all that so he obviously wants to keep his job and he wants money and he got this head coaching job so he's not actually actively being racist and that's kind of the defense a lot of people are using well oh you know those emails that were years ago and you know he wasn't saying this out loud you know this wasn't him he was just saying this in private but if you're saying things in private like I said that's kind of you know who you are at your core you can do whatever you want to kind of you know mask that core and you know you know um, you know however you kind of represent yourself out in public and you know in front of everybody but deep down that's who potentially John Gruden is and that's the biggest thing using this type of language repeatedly um, in private it's not like a one-time case because we get this entire article right here so uh, let's see it's a New York Times article folks let's see it um, we are going to probably read a lot of the language in here, so please don't come at me, folks. I'm not saying these words. I'm reporting. I'm just saying the words that John Gruden used um, so we can all just know the true terminology because if I'm going to say, oh, well, he used the F word and all this, so he used this word, there is one word that, you know, obviously nobody can use unless you are, you know, African-American, so I will definitely not be using that word, but every other word here will probably just try to say unless I feel totally 1000% uncomfortable even just saying it in a reporting fashion uh, because I don't you know I was skimmed the, I skimmed the article a little bit and I was like okay there are a couple of charged up words here uh, but uh, you know we're just trying to be you know mature here you know, I, context matters 100% and really everything that's talked, you know, that people are saying and all that. Um, I don't think we should demonize words individually. Really, context is truly the, you know, in my opinion, the most important thing. Uh, so we're just going to get the facts out there. These were the words that this man was using, folks, that are kind of written down in this article. So please don't come at me, folks. We're not saying these words. We are just reporting on these. Um, you know, language is so important here um, just in kind of life in general of the human species um, you know language is how we express in literally why animals can't evolve is because they don't have language folks that's literally what separates humans from literally every other creature on this earth is that we are able to verbalize what our intentions are what we are saying if uh, you know ants could talk they take over the world in a heartbeat folks it'd be so easy they'd be like Hang on, hey, y'all can talk? Oh, I can talk too. Well, let's get together. I mean, we got millions of us. You see those uh, big, I don't even know what the ants would call us, but y'all see those big people, those big things roaming around this earth on two feet. I mean, we can overtake them, right? If we all coordinate and now we can talk and verbalize and coordinate, ants would take over the world in a, in a second, folks, if they can verbalize. So we are just using our language to get the facts out there because that's really all that matters are the facts and i know you know uh it's a crazy time you know misinformation all that so we're just getting the facts out there folks okay please do not come at us obviously we don't use this language in our day-to-day -day life folks i mean um obviously <laughs> um but um let's just see what we get here in this article and uh, let's see how bad it actually was and if john gruden truly deserved to kind of be forced in our opinion, in a resignation role here. So here is the New York Times article, folks. Raiders coach resigns after homophobic and misogynistic emails. Okay, and emails detailed by the New York Times, Raiders coach John Gruden casually used misogynistic and homophobic language to disparage people. All righty, here we go. Let's jump right into this. Here we go. John Gruden stepped down Monday as the coach of the Las Vegas Raiders football team hours after the New York Times detailed emails in which he made homophobic and misogynistic remarks following an earlier report of racist statements about a union leader. His resignation resignation was a striking departure from the football league for a coach who had won a Super Bowl, been a marquee anal analyst on ESPN, and returned to the NFL in 2018 to lead the resurgent Raiders, which he had coached years before, quote, by John Gruden. I have resigned as head coach of the Las Vegas Raiders. 
I love the Raiders and do not want to be a distraction. Thank you to all the players, coaches, and staffs and fans of Raider Nation. I'm sorry. I never meant to hurt anyone. So there it is. Kind of, hey, John Gruen say, hey, I never meant to hurt anybody. But then we're getting the same, you know, uh, you know, misogynistic, racist, homophobic words used time and time and time again. So, yeah, you didn't mean to hurt anybody. Uh, but you were saying that in email. So once again, it's kind of you're apologizing because you got caught, unfortunately. So let's see, uh, keep it up here and see, you know, uh, what uh, what these emails are saying and everything. So that was his apology. That was kind of what he put out there publicly, uh, his words. But let's continue here to the article. Mark Davis, the owner of the Raiders, said in a statement that he had accepted the resignation. Rich... Biskia, the Raiders special teams coordinator, was elevated to the interim head coach, the team said. So we got the special teams coordinator elevated to the head coaching job. We'll see how that works. Um, Joe Judge was kind of the, I, I believe, kind of the last special teams coordinator that got a head coaching job, the uh, head coach of the Giants. He was special teams coordinator for the Patriots, and now he's the head coach for the Giants for the last two. Is he going into his three? Is this the third season? Something like that. Two, three, four years max. So uh, don't have the uh, <laughs> best kind of track record of becoming good head coaches, but we'll give that man the benefit of the doubt. I mean, this Raiders offense is great, folks. I mean, I really think John Gruden was holding this team back. I mean, that was kind of the big story about John Gruden when he reemerged here as a head coach in the NFL. It was like, well, he inherited that kind of Bucks team that he led to the Super Bowl and then after he won the Super Bowl with that Bucks team and everybody kind of started to leave and you know you couldn't keep everybody together there in 2002 then he goes 7 and 9 5 and 11 he went 11 and 5 lost the first round of the playoffs then 4 and 12 9 and 7 9 and 7 that was his kind of tenure with Tampa Bay after winning that Super Bowl and then you know that was the question you know is he actually a good coach or did he just inherit a good team and took him to the Super Bowl and then that did nothing after that and you know that was kind kind of what we were trying to figure out here with the Raiders and we saw him be trash. I mean, first year 4 and 12, then 7 and 9, then 8 and 8 and you know, not making the playoffs with this star-studded high tempo great offense. Their car is a great elite quarterback in this league and they got piece after piece after piece speed all over the field. So, I really think this is going to be a good thing um in the NFL. Yeah, you get, you know, a little bit of a bigot out of the, you know, out of the league, which is always great. I mean, there's really no, I mean, I still can't wrap my head around that. People just think they're superior or better than just anybody in general, let alone you think you're better than people because of your race or skin color or religion or your sexual orientation or all that. I just honestly, truly cannot wrap my head or my mind around that thought, that concept that a lot of people do kind of show here. Um, so obviously they're better off without having this in the league and he obviously wasn't even a good coach so definitely making the team better just like that so um but let's get back to the article here all right, here we go. Gruden's departure came after a New York Times report that the NFL officials, as part of a separate workplace misconduct investigation that did not directly involve him, found that Gruden has casually and frequently unleashed misogynistic and homophobic language over several years to denigrate people around the game and to mock some of the league's momentous changes. He denounced the emergence of women as referees, the drafting of a a gay player and the tolerance of players protesting during the playing of the national anthem according to emails reviewed by the times Gruden's messages were sent to Bruce Allen, the former president of the Washington football team. Oh, does this surprise us that the Washington football team is at, you know, the peak of all these scandals out there? We just said it, you know, to the lead up of this article. The only kind of other serious article we read was the Washington football team cheerleading scandal, which was absolutely absurd, folks. I can't even believe it. And then, you know, the the um, sexual harassment in the actual kind of front office aspect. I mean, it's Washington football at the end. At the center of every scandal right here. So John Gruden was just sending emails to Washington football team president. How crazy was that? And others while he was working for ESPN as a color analyst during Monday Night Football. In the emails, Gruden called the league's commissioner, Roger Goodell, a, quote, faggot and a, quote, clueless anti-football pussy. <laughs> Jeez. That's the, he was calling Roger Goodell that, folks. Jeez. And just casually, you know, throwing around those slurs and everything like that. 
um, and said that Goodell should have pressured Jeff Fisher, then the coach of the Rams, to draft, quote, queers to reference a reference to Michael Sam, a gay player chosen by the team in 2014. Jeez, um, so, <clears throat> yeah, that's kind of <laughs> crazy to say. Once again, I mean, this is, you know, 2014. It's not like, oh, it, it, folks, once again, we're in like the 21st century. We've been in the 21st century for a while now. I mean, this is no excuse. Well, now it's, tw- well, we're in 2021 now. So, you know, what he said in 2014, you know, oh, he's changed and he's got older folks. I mean, he's still like 40 during this time. I mean, you know, the old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I mean, right here, he's 40, still using this language. You really think anything has really changed? I doubt it. I doubt it. Um, Let's keep going here. In numerous emails during a seven-year period ending in early 2018, Gruden criticized Goodell in the league for trying to reduce concussions and said that Eric Reed, a player who had demonstrated during the playing of the national anthem, should be fired. In several instances, Gruden used a homophobic slur to refer to Goodell in and offensive language to describe some NFL owners, coaches, and journalists who cover the league. And once again, I mean, people are actively protesting here. I mean, we've always supported the kneeling of the national anthem. I mean, if you really feel like you are being, you know, discriminated against, marginalized, whatever it is, then yeah, take action. That's what makes America so great. You can protest and stand up for what you believe in. And players were doing that. Colin Kaepernick literally got blackballed from the league um, because he protested and kind of John Gruden was kind of cheering that on, championing that. I mean, wanting Eric Reed to get fired because he protested because he saw social injustice. So you protest. I mean, you have a platform and he protested. I mean, uh, I can't believe that people actively think that's a wrong thing to do. We are in America. The difference of opinions is always celebrated. We are free. We can say what we want. We can do what we want. We can enact change. I mean, I feel like everybody always forgets. I mean, this is literally supposed to be the greatest country in the world, the melting pot. I always feel people forget America is literally the melting pot. We bring everybody in. We bring everybody in so we can have all these cultures, all these experiences here in, in America. And that one, that's what makes us so great because we, we embrace the uniqueness in the cult, the cultural diversity of everybody. But it's like over these last kind of maybe even 10 years, it's like everybody forgot where the, mel- did y'all not go to high school? We are the melting pot. I think that's the only thing I actually remember of school. Hey, we're the melting pot. We bring in everybody. We celebrate everybody. So the fact that people are still in 2020, 2014, we're still, we're like, no, 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 no. It's straight white people or not. It's like, what, what, what? It's absolutely. Absolutely crazy, folks. It's truly, and um, it, it has no sense of being really in today's day and age, honestly. We need to truly, truly, I don't know what it's going to take. It seems like if it hasn't changed by now, it will never change, which is honestly the craziest thing ever, but... Oh man, it, it, I just, it, when I see things like this and I hear things like this, it's just like, really y'all? What are, what are y'all thinking? What are y'all doing? Honestly, it, it makes no sense to think that you can be superior than anybody else. I, I, I can't even begin to think of that thought, honestly. But let's get back into this um, <clears throat> article here. Gruden, Allen, and the NFL and the Raiders did not respond to request for comment. Ooh, got caught in 4K and nobody wants to own up to that. John Gruden will just kind of send out a tweet like we just said, hey, I didn't mean to hurt anybody. <laughs> Are you did it? <laughs> you didn't mean to hurt anybody? Really? Because it seems like you were trying to hurt some people. You wanted somebody to get fired. That kind of turns around into hurt. You lose your job. You don't get paid. You can't take your, care of your family. Family. That's hurting somebody, John. You didn't mean to hurt somebody by saying they should be fired? Come on. <clears throat> for literally a nonsense reason because he kneeled for the national anthem? I mean, I mean, uh... We, we said that uh, uh, Urban Meyer should be fired, but that was because he didn't ride back on the team plane after a loss and then actively cheated on his wife. I mean, geez. Um, that's, you know, when you could maybe potentially say somebody should be fired, not because they demonstrated and stood up for, they, for, stood up for what they believed in. All right, back to the article. Here we go. 
Although, not with a team at the time, Gruden was still influential in the league and highly coveted as a coach. Mm, highly coveted? <laughs> I don't think he was highly coveted. Jeez. Uh, he had won a Super Bowl with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers following the 2002 season. And in 2018, he was hired for a second stint as the head coach of the Raiders franchise, which includes defensive lineman Carl Nassib, the first active NFL player to publicly declare that he is gay that just came out earlier this season. So how did John Gruden respond to that? I'm sure he was kind of boiling up inside. Jeez. Uh, the league said last week it shared emails with the Raiders in which Gruden made derogatory comments. Gruden told ESPN on Sunday that the league was reviewing emails in which he criticized Goodell and explained that he had been upset about the team owner's lockout of the players in 2011 when some of the emails were written. Gruden said in that interview that he had used an exp expl uh, expletive to refer to Goodell and that he did so because he disapproved of Goodell's emphasis on safety, which he believed was scaring parents into steering their sons away from football. And once again, I mean, so this man is just going to like be gatekeeping information. I mean, concussions and CTE is a real thing in sports, folks, from every level of football. And we say this all the time. If if the actual information about concussions and what CTE, um, the result of playing football, if that actual true information came out, it would potentially ruin the game of football um, as we know it. And that's why they spend so much money kind of making sure this information doesn't get out there. So John Gruden wanting to kind of gatekeep this information because, you know, he thinks it's going to ruin the game. And then, you know, using that derogatory term. And, uh, you know, the, the thing about using derogatory ter terms is like, um, you know, like the F word that we just read up here. It's just like you like uh, this. Um, I heard this like a couple of years ago and it always stuck with me. It was like, you know, you use those words because, you know, you don't have any like your IQ isn't there. I, like I'm not putting people down, but, uh, you know, your IQ, your lesser IQ, because you don't know of another word to use besides that word. I mean, when you really use the word you know let's use the word right here you know kind of describing uh kind of Goodell in this situation as kind of a little lame out here making kind of saying it's like the wrong decision why not just use the word lame or something else that resembles that word why are you going to use that kind of um derogatory slur uh when you really mean something else so it does kind of show a little bit of a lower IQ of people that do use these slurs like that you there's a th thoris this this jeez there's a the source folks use it it tells you what word you can use instead of the word you're thinking of go out and use it dictionaries in the the sources i feel like i'm not saying that word right and how ironic would that be uh but let's get back to this article here let's continue on all right, but Gruden's behavior was not limited to 2011. Gruden exchanged emails with Allen and other men that included photos of women wearing only bikini bottoms, including one of the two Washington team cheerleaders. Oh, my God. And once again, it's coming back to that original article where we talked about the Washington team football cheerleaders where they were brought to another country to do a photo shoot and, like, the, the cheerleading kind of um, the head of the cheerleading department, whatever it is, they, like, took all the cheerleaders passports so they couldn't really leave it's a bizarre article folks it's from like 2018 2019 if you can find it truly read it because it's some shocking things in there so once again they're like using this in john gruden is like sending those photos around and they were using those cheerleaders as escorts for like high profile people of the team like season ticket holders and all that it was truly bizarre and now somehow john gruden got those pictures how did john gruden get those pictures into uh, when, when did this come out? They, they got a date here. Uh, but, you know, sometimes in like the early two, uh, 2010s, you know, getting these pictures here when he was not even in football. He was for ESPN. That's not Washington football team. He's not a part of that, but he was still getting the pictures of the cheerleaders in their bikini bottoms. It's like, geez. Um, so once again, that's not that's not great all around. Tying back to that Washington uh, football team organization, which has been hot, in hot water for the last couple of years. So. Not great. Uh, you know, bad company usually kind of hangs around each other. Mm. 
Gruden also criticized President Obama during his re-election campaign in 2012, as well as then Vice President Joe Biden, whom Gruden called a, quote, nervous, clueless pussy. John Gruden loves throwing that word pussy around. Hey, John Gruden's not a pussy. I mean, do you watch this man? He's all energy, all masculine energy out here, calling everybody pussies out here. Uh, he used similar words to describe Goodell in Demor uh, Demor Demoris Smith, the executive director of the NFL Players Association. The league is already investigating Gruden as a result of another email he wrote to Allen in 2011 in which he used racist terms to describe Smith, who is black. In that email, Gruden, who is white and was working for ESPN at the time, criticized Smith's intelligence and used a racist trope to describe his face. The correspondence was first reported by the Wall Street Journal and confirmed by the New York Times. Taken together, the emails provide an unvarnished look into the clubby culture of one NFL circle of peers where white male decision makers felt comfortable sharing pornographic images, dereading, deriding the league's policies in jocularly sharing homophobic language. Their banter flies in the face of the league's public denouncements of racism and sexism and its promise to be more inclusive amid criticism for not listening to the concerns of black players who make up about 70% of NFL rosters. The NFL has in the past struggled to discipline personnel who have committed acts of domestic violence and been condemned for failing to adequately address harassment of women, including NFL cheerleaders. The league, Smith and Davis, all denounced Gruden's comments about Smith when they surfaced, but the coach still led his team in, game, in its game Sunday against the Chicago Bears. Gruden said Friday that he did not remember sending the email and that his language, quote, went too far, adding, quote, I never had a blade of racism in me. Gruden's emails to Allen who was fired by Washington football team at the end of 2019, were reviewed as part of an NFL investigation of workplace misconduct within the franchise that ended the summer. Goodell instructed league executives to look at more than 650,000 emails during the first few months, including those in which Gruden made offensive remarks. Last week, Gruden received a summary of their findings, and the league sent the Raiders some of the emails written by Gruden. In the exchange, Gruden used his personal email account while Allen wrote from the team account. I mean, that's right there. I mean, you can't be using, uh, you know, team servers. Come on, what are you doing? That's mistake number one, Jays. Um, in some cases, Allen initiated the conversation and Gruden chimed in, while in other cases, they trade vulgar comments several times. Some of the emails between Gruden and Allen also included businessmen friends, Ed Drost, the co-founder of Hooters, <laughs> jeez, of course, uh, Ed Drost, the co-founder of Hooters, Jim McVeigh, an executive who has run the Outback Bowl annually held in Tampa, Florida. Is that Sean McVeigh's brother? Any relation there? Any relation there? Interesting. And Nick Reeder, the founder of PDQ Restaurants, a Tampa-based fried chicken franchise. The exchange begins in the exchanges begin as early as 2010, while Gruden was an analyst for Monday Night Football. In 2018, he signed a 10-year, $100 million contract with the Raiders. Drost, McVeigh, and Reader did not respond to requests for comments. Gruden and Allen are long are longtime friends and colleagues. Allen was a senior executive with the Raiders from 1995 to 2003 when he worked with Gruden, who was head coach of the team from 1998 to 2001. Gruden became head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in 2002 and beat the Raiders in the Super Bowl that season. Allen became the general manager there in 2004. Allen and Gruden both left the Bucs after the 2008 season. While Gruden moved to a broadcast role with ESPN, Allen became the general manager in Washington in 2010 and later the team's president. Allen, who was the son of a legendary NFL coach, George Allen and Gruden, whose father coached at Notre Dame and whose brother Jay and Jay Gruden, head coach of Washington from 2014 to 2018. So the Grudens, I mean, all all up in the Washington football teams, you know, dealings with the cheerleaders and the sexual assault and harassment allegations at the front office. So does not seem like a good kind of group of people to kind of be around. Am I right? 
um, are part of an exclusive network of that cycles between NFL teams, networks, and companies affiliated with the league. In June, the NFL congratulated Nassib after he became the first active NFL player to publicly declare that he is gay. Goodell said he was, quote, proud of Carl for courageously sharing his truth today. Representation matters, and that is 100% representation truly matters, folks. And, you know, um, you know, a lot of people that don't believe in that, you know, are kind of just white people in general, and that's because they were always shown the representation. So now they're like, well, why, do, why, why does representation matter? Well, yeah, y'all can say that because you have been seeing the repre representation your entire life, so you don't even know uh, that that's what that is, and people look up to that. So, you know, diversifying everything, I mean, I think it makes everything better. Seeing, uh, you know, young generations, young faces, seeing their kind of same you know, skin color, orientation, sexual orientation, uh, things that they they can kind of identify with, seeing that in high roles, whether it's on TV or just in positions of power. I mean, I truly do believe that makes a difference. Representation matters, folks. And John Gruden trying to be the gatekeeper of representation. Uh, why? Who gave him that right? Who, who decides to gatekeep any information? Once again, America, the land of the free. There should be no gatekeeping on any anything there should, we are the melting pot folks it really should be that simple i don't understand why it is not just everybody thinking like that unless everybody just kind of brings up the just kind of the outlier cases but i mean it doesn't seem to be that of how just you know regular videos i mean twitter you see social media um that kind of you know if you if you don't you know fall into an algorithm like kind of facebook it can show you exactly what is truly going on in the world. Um, and, you know, we see case after case of just people being absolute, like, out of their mind. Like, it's mental illness, honestly. It's honestly crazy. But let's get back to this article here. We are close to being done. And we got really no, we got, what, like, two instances? So uh, let's keep going here uh, before we make an uh, overall final conclusion. And uh, what do we got? Here we go. <clears throat> Privately, Allen and Gruden appeared to have a few to have a few boundaries in exposing homophobic and transphobic language. In one email from 2015 that includes Drost, McVeigh, and others, Gruden crudely asked Allen to tell Brian Glazer, whose family owns the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, where Gruden coached until 28, 2008, to perform oral sex on him. Allen said Glazer would, quote, take you up on that offer. Okay. Um, Allen and Gruden also mocked Caitlyn Jenner, who received an award from ESPN in 2015 after she transitioned. Um, in an email from 2015, Allen, Gruden, Allen and Gruden criticized a con congressional bill that aimed to force Washing the Washington franchise to change its name, which the team stopped using last year, again using a vulgar term. Gruden took aim at Goodell and his staff, even though the commissioner had initially defended the team's right to keep the name. In 2000 2017, Dross shared with the group sexist, a sexist meme of a female referee to which Gruden um, to to which Gruden replied, quote, nice job, Roger. That same year, Gruden was sent a link to an article about NFL players calling on Goodell to support their efforts promoting racial equality and criminal justice reform. Gruden had advice for Goodell, said, quote, he needs to hide in his concussion protocol tent. Okay, so um, I thought we were going to get some more examples. I mean, I would like to see the exact emails, the exact wor wording. Um, obviously, you know, it is kind of a repeated history, you know, spanning from 2010 all the way kind of up until now. Um, just, uh, you know. It's obviously not a good look ever using these terms, you know, in private or in public. And uh, that's kind of what John Gruden was kind of doing, saying all this stuff in public that he knew he would never say or the things that he said in private, he knew he would never say in public. And that's kind of, you know, a good guide. If you're saying things in private that you wouldn't say in public, yeah, that's kind of, you know, you uh, potential racist, homophobic because you know it's wrong, but you are still saying them in private. So. Um, that's where we're at with John Gruden. Um, we don't really get that many examples and the examples that we do get definitely, you know, are not great. Um, so, uh, 
I would just like to see the evidence. And, you know, I don't, you know, I don't need somebody to tell me the evidence. Just show me the evidence. I mean, I can make my own conclusions. I can, I, I don't need somebody to think for me. Um, you know, I know what is right and I know what is wrong. Um, and this so far is wrong. <laughs> it's very not good wrong. Um, so, um, and especially, you know, being him being around that whole Washington football team, that's just nothing that, uh, <laughs> nothing that is good, truly. So, um, that's where we're at with Roger, Good uh, not Roger Goodell, um, John Gruden. So fired, gone, out of the league, never will probably be in the league again. Definitely won't get his job back at uh, ESPN for Monday Night Football. And we potentially will never hear from John Gruden again, which is probably a good thing just overall. Because he can't coach and he's not a good human being. So that's where we're at. So, Alrighty, folks, that's, that's John Gruden. Out, out, fired, and rightfully so. Alrighty, so now that we got that information out of the way, let's go out and break down the Monday Night Football game from last night, folks. Sheesh, what a very entertaining game. Once again, all these primetime, nationally televised games are absolutely great games. Uh, suspenseful, entertaining, really all coming down to the wire, and this one was no different. So, the Ravens get the win 31-25, to but the Ravens struggled offensively all game long, and that's what the Ravens are. We say it all the time they are just Lamar Jackson that's how great Lamar Jackson is he single-handedly carries the offense himself and uh you know when he struggles or when yeah when he struggles the offense struggles and when he's on man oh man buckle up uh because they could be one of the most dangerous offenses that there is because there is just so much to guard obviously you have to guard Lamar guard Lamar Jackson who is a pure like that the definition of dual threat quarterback it's Lamar Jackson in the in the dictionary it just shows Lamar Jackson's face we, we, it's not Michael Vick anymore he is not kind of the prototypical dual threat quarterback anymore it is now Lamar Jackson who can run for 100 yards a game throw for 300 uh, run for or throw for 100 maybe even run for 300 I wouldn't put it past him and that's kind of what we saw last night, the Lamar Jackson show, and it was absolutely fantastic. So, struggled in the first half, you know, three and out first drive, three and out second drive, five plays, 26 yards, half to punt on the third drive, fourth drive, six plays, 32 yards, still kind of stalling and stuttering, and then they finally kind of get into the red zone, and it stalls a little bit, and they have to settle for a field goal. Luckily, this Ravens defense wasn't giving up any points either. They gave up only 10 points for the first half, but it's not like Carson Wentz was slinging around the ball. They got lucky and hit a home run 75-yard screen play. That's not on Carson Wentz. So when we look at Carson Wentz's stats here, we are going to have to kind of take away 75 yards because that's just one chunk play that he had. So let's uh, we, uh, we can start here with uh, Carson Wentz. Damn, he threw for four. He threw for 402 yards. Carson Wentz threw for 402 yards. Really? Damn. I did not think he threw for that many. Um, damn. You know, we watch the games live here, and then we don't really look at the stats until, like, the next day. And, sheesh, 400 yards by Carson Wentz. I'll give him credit for that. But, unfortunately, couldn't make the right plays at the right time and, uh, you know, still get beat, you know, when they were up. I mean, the largest lead that they had was, what do we got, 25-9? to nine, And they still let him come back. So, truly unfortunate there with Carson Wentz. But let's get his completion percentage up and all that and uh, start talking about some of these numbers here that we saw last night. So Carson Wentz goes 23 of 35, 23 of 35, which is 65% completion percentage. That's real good. 402 yards, that's real. That's absolutely great. Uh, two touchdowns, real good. No interceptions, but he did have a fumble, though, and it was not really that crucial, uh, but, uh, you know, they fumble on their next drive after. After that touchdown drive and luckily for Carson Wentz it does not result into any points here by the Ravens uh, you know they go five and out unfortunately after that fumble uh, so really kind of a clean game here by this Colts team just unfortunately a little bit too conservative down the stretch right here and we see it right here on this blocked field goal drive. So the Ravens just made it an eight-point game, being down 25-17. to 17. And then on the Colts' following drive, they get down in great field position. 
and uh, they just start running the ball ultra conservative. As soon as they kind of hit the 27-yard line of the Ravens, they go ultra conservative. First and 10 at the 27, seven-yard run. Second and three at the Baltimore 30, two-yard run. Third and one at the 18, one-yard run to pick up the first down. And after they picked up that first down, they're like, well, let's keep running. It worked again. It worked last time. It worked last series, uh, or it just worked the last three plays. Let's do it again for three more plays to pick up the first down. Let's eat up some of this clock, and uh, let's get out of here with the win. So a little too conservative here, not truly trusting Carson Wentz. And we know Frank Reich and Carson Wentz do have history together, I believe, in Philadelphia. And now he's not trusting him to close out this game. Ultra conservative. It's unfortunate play calling right here. But here we go. After they pick up the first down, there's six minutes left in the fourth quarter, still up eight. They're at the Ravens' 17-yard line. They run the ball. Uh, they get a minus one-yard run. So now it's second and 11 at the Ravens' 18-yard line. They do a three-yard run. And then on third and eight, and this is the most appalling one, on third and eight at the 15-yard line, they run the ball on third and eight? Third and eight to run off a couple more seconds? Come on. You got to be a little bit more aggressive. Trust Carson Wentz. Um, we've seen him you know, turn the ball over in the red zone. We've seen him fumble and all that. So maybe that got in Frank Wright's, you know, mind to really kind of make this decision. Hey, we should run for it on third and eight. And it ends up being a four, a negative four yard run. And it sets up really a chip shot field goal, 37 yards, but it gets blocked. Great job by that Ravens defense to step up absolutely hugely to give Lamar Jackson one final chance and he absolutely took it because we know he goes down and scores a touchdown and the two-point conversion once again to Mark Andrews give credit to tight end university folks Mark Andrews scored the last two touchdowns and uh, had the first two-point conversion I believe he goes to Marquise Br does he go for no, he goes to Mark Andrews again. He goes to Marquise Brown in overtime for the game-winning touchdown. But, man, oh, man, Mark Andrews, folks. Sheesh, tight ends getting it done out there. And y'all know they to taught that at tight end university, the class of being clutch, of being great. They show that all the time there. Um, that's the class... That's freaking held up by uh, uh, Travis Kelsey and George Kittle. They know about being clutch. You know, they know about getting to the Super Bowl, winning, and putting up big performances there. So they taught that to everybody at tight end university. And Mark Andrews uh, aced that class, you could say. So very well done to the Ravens. And then they get the ball in overtime. And Lamar Jackson, you know, we have seen him make a lot of mistakes here. Uh, we saw it against the Chiefs. You know, he throws, I believe, a pick six on kind of their first drive. And then, like, another interception. And, you know, kind of getting stalled out in the first half. But then they come back in the second half and win the game against the Chiefs. And this game kind of went exactly like that. Struggling. You know, we talked about all the punts in the first half. And then he fumbles on the goal line. On the goal line. Real bad play by Lamar Jackson, truly. Um, you know, should have just handed it off. It was kind of a uh, RPO or just a read option. And uh, he ends up keeping it and tries to get into the end zone himself. And he fumbles on the one yard line. And that's kind of a little concern that we do have with Lamar Jackson. That's the only knock that we have on Lamar Jackson is that, you know, sometimes he can be a little uh, turnover prone. We saw it last year in the playoffs against the Bills in the red zone, throws a pick six. It's from like the five yard line and he throws a pick six. And that really kind of ices the game. Uh, I don't think any more points were scored by the Ravens after they you know stalled in that red zone drive for the interception and then we see him here trying to come back in the third quarter the first drive out of halftime here for the Ravens he goes down and it's a great drive it's a 13 play 79 yard 7 minute drive it's a fantastic drive but he unfortunately results into him fumbling so we do need Lamar Jackson in the most well and that's why it's so kind of bonkers and bizarre to talk about because it's not like he's not clutch we know he's clutch. We just saw it last night. So it's not that we can call him clutch or not clutch. It's just he definitely needs to kind of shore up the ball security in some high pressure filled situations right here. So that's the only knock that we have on Lamar Jackson. Clean up the turnovers, please, because they are going to get you in trouble. Yeah, they didn't get you in trouble against the Chiefs game. Yes, they didn't get you in trouble against this Colts game. But they did get you in trouble last season in the playoffs against the Bills. And I don't want that to happen again this season with Lamar Jackson, where they get into the playoffs and they're looking good. But then it's Lamar Jackson turning over the ball at the worst time. And then in the playoffs, it's so hard to come back because the intensity and the, uh, the level of 
competition and the level of just great overall play is so much high, is so high in the playoffs that one mistake can truly cost you. In the regular season, you can get away with it. We've seen it. So just keep that in mind. Lamar Jackson, and it's unfortunate because it has to always be always on Lamar Jackson uh, because he's the offense, run, pass, delivering the ball deep, short, all of that, um, kind of manipulating the defense. I mean, using his eyes, utilizing his legs to kind of look off the safety or make the corners press up or make the linebackers kind of take him and leave the tight end wide open in the middle of the field. I mean, we've seen this all the time. It's truly Lamar Jackson. This is the only offense in the NFL that is 100% dictated by the quarterback not even the other dual threat quarterbacks have kind of what this Ravens offense is Baker Mayfield has two great running backs and they utilize everybody Baker Mayfield's a game manager he's a little bit of a dual threat kind of on the the end spectrum of dual threat uh, Ryan Tannehill, same thing, but they got Derrick Henry, and he's just a game manager. But when we're talking about real dual threat quarterbacks like uh, Patrick Mahomes, obviously this is not his game. Patrick Mahomes barely runs, even though he is kind of a good running quarterback. Uh, Kyler Murray doesn't run. It doesn't kind of just immediately take off. Kyler Murray doesn't really have any direct snap plays to him. Um, and Deshaun Watson, yeah, he's very mobile, but he's a great passer, and he usually passes a lot more, runs more than – Patrick Mahomes does, but not as much as Lamar Jackson does. So nobody runs and passes as much as Lamar Jackson does in tandem. So he is truly the, the definition, like we said, of dual threat quarterback out here. Um, all right, so Lamar Jackson struggles here. Uh, fumbles there, but once that fumble happens, he puts his team on the back. They go down, score a touchdown in the third quarter, and then, like we said, down 16, um, they score two touchdowns to get right back on track, tie up the game, and then Lamar Jackson doesn't make the same mistake twice and gets it done in overtime. And goes to Marquise Brown in the end zone. Love seeing him hooking up with Marquise Brown, uh, giving him some recognition out here. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, so let's talk about Lamar Jackson because, folks, I mean, this stat line is absolutely wild, and really, we just have to watch it. We just have to watch it, and let's do that. Let's put on these Lamar Jackson highlights, and we'll just let them run while we're breaking down the stats because, I mean, honestly, this is you just have to you just have to watch. If you didn't watch it last night, it's unfortunate because this was fantastic. But uh, let's just watch this five-minute highlight clip play Lamar Jackson's best plays from his freaking absolutely star-studded stat-filled. The night here so he goes 37 of 43 passing let's get that up here look at all this buying time and look at him right there and then I mean folks I mean this is what Lamar Jackson does this is why it's so hard to guard because you have to guard Lamar Jackson then you have to guard the running backs and all the wide receivers but then you have to t guard Lamar Jackson running the ball and then escaping in the pocket and buying all the time and then once he truly takes off you still have to worry about him uh, because he's going to put this move on you it's going to look like he's going to just go out of bounds because that's what he probably should do here not to take the big hit but he's so agile he he is so athletic that quick cuts he can just turn on a dime and just look at this play right here. He's looking to go out of bounds, but then last second he's like, you know what, I'm going to cut inside, makes that defender miss, and then picks up the first down when it really looked like he was going to run out of bounds like seven, three yards short of the first down. And can we just watch Lamar Jackson dance around in the pocket? I mean, just look at this. It's kind of looking a little slow here. He's taking his time. He's literally toying with the defense. It's not like Lamar Jackson is 100% sprinting. It's like what running backs do where they kind of just dance in the kind of backfield waiting for that hole to open up. They're not just instantly taking the ball and running 100 miles an hour forward. They're kind of, all right, buying a little time, waiting for something to open, something to develop, and then hitting the hole, going 100 miles an hour. That's what Lamar Jackson does as a dual threat quarterback. I mean, his IQ is just so great, and he's just toying with all of these defenders. Every single move in the pocket by Lamar Jackson is, I can tell you, is 100% calculated. Just look at him step up in the pocket, and then he, not, he doesn't kind of instantly instantly roll out to the right here he just kind of turns his shoulders a little bit and that's all he has to do to make defenders miss is turn his shoulders a little bit folks it's you can't bring this man down and after he turns his shoulders a little bit and then he finally escapes out of the pocket and he's still keeping his eyes down the field and then he decides to run with it and now he's like you know what yeah I can go out of bounds but I'm gonna make this man look silly and I'm gonna just kind of whoop I'm going to whoop on him, and then he gets the first down. I mean, that's what Lamar Jackson is, folks. Holy moly. And there's no other dual threat quarterback like Lamar Jackson. He is it. Kyler Murray, Deshaun Watson, Patrick Mahomes.
They cannot do the running aspect like Lamar Jackson can do. Now, those other quarterbacks maybe have a little bit of a better arm, but I'm not, like, the difference, the gap is not that big. We're not talking about drastic differences. I mean, we saw him, you know, hit, uh, hit a big bomb here to Marquise Brown that will probably be in the highlight to tape here. 43 yards to Marquise Brown wide open so he can air it out. We've seen that. Um, it's just, you know, his arm isn't, you know, the thing that defines him like all the other quarterbacks are. Um, so it's just absolutely fantastic. But let's keep these highlights running here. Jeez Louise. Uh, so Lamar Jackson, 37 of 43. What do we get here? 37 of 43, 86% completion percentage. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I don't know where everybody's getting these numbers from. A lot of people are saying 90% completion percentage where he only had like two missed throws. Uh, but the stats here say 43 attempts. Um, so I don't know if they were breaking it down by specialty yards or something like that. Uh, let me see what the score mobile says here on our phone. Yes, still 37 of 43. So a lot of people were saying 90% completion percentage, 86% completion percentage is still so stupid. And can we talk about this throw right here? Once again, Mark Andrews, tight end university, shout out that. And we're going to break him down more in depth here when we get to our tight end Tuesday segment. Uh, but just look at this throw right here. This is a beautiful throw right here. The fake here. And once again, this is why you have to guard everything, folks. This is why you have to guard everything. Let's get this play up here. Had to rewind a second. Lamar Jackson taken off here on the previous play. But now we're going to get this play. Watch this play. The fake to the wide receiver screen. The fake back to kind of just passing downfield. And then he goes to Mark Andrews here on the right sideline. Look at how beautifully this ball is thrown, folks. Right over the corner, right under the safety in that soft spot, and it picks up the first down, and it gets him in the red zone, and you're utilizing your great tight end down there, who will always get open. I mean, just folks, just watch and marvel in Lamar Jackson, folks. Um, so, great completion percentage, 86% completion percentage, 442 yards passing, four touchdowns, no picks. He did have the fumble, like we said, so still one turnover on the goal line. Definitely, like we said, need to clean that up. That's the only knock that we have on Lamar Jackson. Look at him escape the pocket here. I mean, that's a surefire sack. Nobody's going to be able to catch up with him. He picks up the third down on third and three, and he wants some more right there. Once again, you can't bring this man down. You think you have this man brought down, but that's what Lamar Jackson kind of plays into. He slows down. He's not 100%, you know, going 100 miles an hour on every single play, so he can quick cut and stay on his feet and recover from hits and pushes and all that because he takes his time, and he's so precise, and his vision is absolutely Absolutely excellent, folks. And then he picks up a couple more yards right there after the scramble and escape. You gotta love it. Now we get in the red zone right here, stepping up in the pocket, delivering a ball. Boom. Who we got there going down to the one yard line? I don't think that's Sammy Watkins, number 13. Whoever it is down at the one yard line, that's where he fumbles, unfortunately. But then he's back here. Once again, going to Mark Andrews. Absolutely fantastic. Let's talk about his rushing yards. 14 carries for 62 yards. The man has over 500 yards by himself in the game. And then we get the deep ball by Marquise Brown. Absolutely 100% on the money. Let's count the yards here because that's what everybody kind of says. Lamar Jackson doesn't have a big arm. He's not a quarterback. He's a running back at the quarterback position. Well, let's see how deep this ball was. So he's going to launch this one from his 50-yard line from midfield field and get it all the way down to basically the goal line call it 43 44 yards but it's a hundred percent or uh 50 or 47 48 yards there it's 50 yards there clean precise accurate 100 percent on the money folks look at where this ball lands it's not like marquise brown has to slow down which would be an underthrown ball it's not like uh, marquise brown has to speed up because it's an overthrown ball and he has to run with uh, run underneath it and dive at the last second to just get his fingertips on it no 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 this is 100 percent accurate as hack folks accurate as hack. You can't get any more accurate than that. 100% accurate ball on a 50-yard bomb by Lamar Jackson. Give the man some credit, folks. And stop with the disrespect. He's just a running back. So Lamar Jackson, leading rusher here, 14 carries for 62 yards. Latavius Murray, only six 
care and uh, can we talk about oh my goodness i love tight ends folks y'all know we do can we talk about this grab right here and this was on the drive to win the game right here once again lamar jackson putting this ball absolutely on the money right here look at how tight this throw has to be folks two defenders on each or uh, defender on each side of mark andrews but then you got these other defenders back here you got kind of a four box of defenders here guarding Mark Andrews. So if it's underthrown, you're screwed. If it's a little bit uh, thrown to the left, you're screwed. If it's a little bit thrown to the right, you're screwed. It's 100% on the money. And Mark Andrews makes an absolutely beautiful catch right there because that's what Mark Andrews does. That's what tight ends do out here. They always get it done. So once again, the accuracy on these longer balls, his deep ball accuracy is real, real solid, folks. Real great, I'll even say. Man. Dumping down to Mark Andrews. Look at Mark Andrews making a miss. Ooh, 10 yards and more. Ooh, shifty. Shifty, folks. And you don't know why he's shifty? Because he's the leading receiver here for this Ravens team, folks. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, Mark Andrews, leading receiver, 11 receptions for 147 yards, two touchdowns, and we're going to get one right here over the middle of the field, working back, finding that open space, Lamar Jackson standing t uh, confident in the pocket, and he's just delivering it to his tight end, and we're going to get one here, Mark Andrews, boom, for the two-point conversion, folks, clutch, clutch, tight ends are clutch out here, so y'all get the gist of what Lamar Jackson is folks as a quarterback he is truly the whole offense here it's absolutely great Marquise Brown second leading receiver here for the Ravens nine receptions for 125 yards and two touchdowns himself Devin Duvernay four receptions 45 yards Sammy Watkins two receptions 35 yards the man is not even utilizing Sammy Watkins which uh, I'm a little not not keen on I want to see Lamar Jackson air it out more I want this to be in the play calling having Sammy Watkins take some deep shots two receptions for only 35 yards Devontae Freeman three receptions for 34 yards James Proche, two receptions, 15 yards. Tyson Williams, two receptions, 15 yards. Latavius Murray, two receptions, 13 yards. Josh Oliver, two receptions, 13 yards. Spreading the ball all over the field. Wide receivers, tight ends, running backs. He's delivering the ball exactly to where he needs to be because that's the offense here of the Ravens. There is so much to guard that there will always be one thing left open, whether it is a wide receiver, a tight end, or a running back, or if everything's covered, then that means Lamar Jackson is open and free to roam, and then he utilizes is it. We see it time and time again. So Lamar Jackson just toys with these offenses and he toyed with them on those last two drives to score those two point conversions and the touchdowns who tied the game going overtime. And I mean, just look at these last drives, folks. These last three drives Ravens, six plays, 78 yards, two minutes, 11 plays, 75 yards, three minutes, 50 seconds, overtime, 10 plays, 68 yards, four and a half minutes. So just utilizing the clock, eating up the clock, not eating up the clock, scoring quick, scoring fast. To scoring slow, a little bit slower out there, going the entire length of the field, starting at their own 22, starting at their own 25, starting at their own 32, scoring touchdowns on them. Give this team some credit. All righty. What else do we got here? Um, so yeah, that's the Ravens, folks. The Ravens' offense is absolutely fantastic. The defense was getting after Carson Wentz a little bit out there. Uh, they had two sacks overall. Some big hits in this game here with these sacks. Not a lot of sacks. Uh, Ravens had two sacks. Colts had uh, two sacks as well. But they were big monster hits right there. And well done for both of these quarterbacks of getting up and still balling out after those big hits that they took. All right, now let's finish up on this Colts team quickly. Carson Wentz goes 25 of 35 for 402 yards. Like we said, 65% completion percentage, two touchdowns. Jonathan Taylor, 15 carries for 53 yards, one touchdown. Marlon Mack, once again, they're utilizing Marlon Mack. You know, we talked about it two weeks ago. They were trying to trade Marlon Mack, but uh, it seems like they kind of, you know, mended their relationship. Marlon Mack kind of wanted to be out because they weren't utilizing him. Well, they got him five carries for 47 yards. Naheem Hines getting into the mix as well, four carries for 18 yards. So utilizing all their running backs. Jonathan Taylor was the leading receiver because of the kind of set up screen play on the first touchdown that came out. I think it was third down. Yeah, third and 15. And they allowed the, you know, the set up screen. So unfortunate there by the Ravens defense, a little, uh, little flat out of the gate, unfortunately. But uh, they clean it up for the rest of the game. So still a shout out to this Ravens defense. 
So Jonathan Taylor, leading receiver here for the Colts, three receptions for 116 yards and a touchdown. And then Michael Pittman, man, holy moly, this touchdown catch by him. Can we bring this up somehow? I got to watch this replay, folks. Oh, it's the best. This is exactly what we wanted to see from Michael Pittman. They have to have an auto highlight up here because, uh, yeah, here it is. Here it is. Oh, my goodness. This is so great, folks. Michael Pittman, this is what we've been talking about. Folks, we've been talking about Michael Pittman this entire season, folks. We, you know, especially with T.Y. Hilton not being in here for the Colts because, you know, he's banged up. He should be back anytime soon, hopefully, sooner rather than later because, I mean, they need him. They're one and four. But, I mean, this is what we've been expecting from Michael Pittman from the get-go. And, unfortunately, this team isn't great overall. They're losing close games. They're not winning the close games. Um, and, you know, they're just not getting out to these big, hot starts. And that's a little bit on Michael Pittman, too. But this is what we wanted to see. This is kind of what we know Michael Pittman can do. Here we go. They're up 10-3 to here. First drive after halftime here for the Colts. Carson Wentz launching this one from from his own 50-yard line, Michael Pittman Jr. double covered, ball underthrown here as Carson ha Carson Wentz was taking a shot, but it's Michael Pittman going over the body of the defender, catching the ball, staying on his feet, and then getting the last 10, 15 yards here to go in for the score. Look at that! Look at that! Stays on his feet, can't get brought down. This great catch right here, coming over the defender. It's absolutely great. Look how underthrown this ball is. He has to literally. He's getting. Hit, he's getting kind of pushed. He's getting. A little pass interfered with he has to come back toward the ball look at that great catch great focus right hands on the ball boom big tall weapon out there I think what do we say six three 6-4 maybe even potentially, but that's what Michael Pittman Jr. needs to do every single game, every single play, and it's a little bit a little bit unfortunate that it's taken a little bit of a while, taking it five weeks for him to truly, you know, take this opportunity to be the A1 Tier 1 wide receiver option on this team because when T.Y. Hilton comes back, uh, you know, he's going to take over the role of, you know, the A1 Tier 1 receiver here for the Colts, so I'm glad that Michael Pittman finally got going here on that catch. Absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. Just another unfortunate heartbreak for this Colts team. Paris Campbell, four receptions, 56 yards. Mo Ali Cox, a tight end, three receptions, 50 yards. Zach Poshkel, three receptions, 48 yards. Kylan Granson, two receptions, 19 yards. Ashton Doolin, two receptions, 13 yards. So um, after we just read all those names, obviously we need T.Y. Hilton back in this lineup here. But it's just unfortunate. This Colts team not winning the close games and doing worse than what they did last year with Phillip Rivers. And we were not expecting that uh, with Carson Wentz here. So they're just not making the right play here and we even get that here by Frank Reich. He regrets the conservative third down call in the collapse of the Ravens saying, quote, I wish I had that one back. And that's exactly what we were saying there on this block field goal drive of just being super ultra conservative. Why not trust Carson Wentz? Because he was playing really solid here. He was making some good plays here overall. He had 400 yards passing. So you got to give the man some type of credit here. Um, you know, underthrown ball, set up screen, going for basically 125 yards. But, you know, other than that, he was still getting it done and working the ball down the field, especially in the second half. But then they just got conservative and the field goals were getting blocked and missed. I mean, this really should have been a win for the Colts. It's truly unfortunate. 47-yard field goal is a chip shot. We know that, uh, you know, all the field goals were getting missed this week. I don't know what it was, something in the air with the kickers. But, uh Ravens end up winning. They take their advantage. They win the overtime coin toss. They receive the ball, and that's all she wrote here. So Ravens and Lamar Jackson here getting it done. Unfortunately, don't break the rushing record of 45 straight games of having 100 yards plus rushing, but I don't think they care uh, because, you know, they they won the game, and Lamar Jackson got it done. Only 86 rushing yards, 14 yards shy of that record. Truly unfortunate, but they tie the record. So. So they still got the record. They just didn't break it. They got to share the record. So Ravens get the win 31 to 25, folks. Very well done. And then this is what Lamar Jackson has done, folks. First quarterback in NFL history to complete 85% of passes in a 400-yard game. First quarterback in NFL history to do that. No Patrick Mahomes, no Tom Brady, no Dan Marino, no Aaron Rodgers, no Joe Montana. It's Lamar Jackson, baby. Give the man some credit.
highest completion percentage in a 40 pass game in NFL history. Once again, not Tom Brady, not Aaron Rodgers, not Patrick Mahomes, not John Montana, Joe Montana, not Dan Marino. It's this man right here. Big trust out here. Big trust. Get that. Yeah, sorry. Get that up there. Um, this is the new canvas coming up. Just a zoom in of Lamar Jackson with the towel. Yes, sir. Let me save this picture. Get that on the canvas behind us at some point. Franchise record, 442 passing yards. Joe Flacco didn't do that. I don't even know the other Ravens quarterbacks. They're irrelevant. It's Lamar Jackson, folks. Overcame largest deficit of his NFL career, 19 points. Lamar Jackson shattering records last night and doing it in fashion and getting the win while doing so. Give the man some respect. Alrighty, so that was Monday Night Football from last night. Now let's head over to our Tight End Tuesdays. Tight End University, folks, where we highlight the great performances by the tight ends through the week, folks. And we are doing this to crown the best tight end and giving them the summa cum laude honors of graduating Tight End University this season. So we're keeping an active list of all the tight ends that do great on a week-by-week -week basis that have an impact in winning the game or keeping the game close or, you know, heartbreaking loss. That's no fault of their own, but we are looking for plays that impacted it. So we're not judging every single tight end. We're just taking the cream of the crop week by week and giving them a letter grade. And then whoever has the most best letter grades at the end of the season will graduate as the summa cum laude and be resulted as the best tight end in football heading into next season. So that's what we're looking to do here. We do this every single week on Tuesday. Now that uh, week five has officially wrapped up, every team has played, we can start judging some talent here and giving out some good grades. So let's start here with the first tight end, and we got to go to the London game, folks. The London game, because finally, no Calvin Ridley. So Kyle Pitts gets the cream of the crop receptions and targets, and he made the most of them. 10 targets on 9 receptions for 119 yards and a touchdown, folks. And there's so many plays that we just have to watch every single play here by Kyle Pitts. So let's watch the 2 minute and 30 highlight here, and we'll decide a letter grade off. Off of him, but he was the leading receiver, got a score. Let's see when all of his catches came. Was he clutch? Was he getting it done in the key situations? So let's let's let the tape roll and see what Kyle Pitts was doing across the pond. Cheerio in London. Here we go. I don't know. Do they have A pluses in London? I don't know the grading system there. I never went to school in London, so um, I don't know what the grading procedure is I don't know uh, so let's see here we go Kyle Pitts this is the first play of the game getting this man out to a good start but he didn't go for no yards so trying to do a little bit of a drive starter there unfortunately wrapped up very well done by the Jets defense but he's got more to come folks boom there we go picking up the first down on second and ten big getting them down inside the ten yard line they capitalized with three points because Matt Ryan just couldn't get it done if uh, you're throwing to Kyle Pitts in the red zone he'll get it done he's only got one drop or one uh one incompletion here and then here we go the next play here second and ten again picking up the first downs keeping the ball moving and can we talk about that catch right there oof woof and now here we go on the goal line from the two yard line here we go Matt Ryan play action pass and it's Kyle Pitts corner end zone touchdown come on that's too easy why are you not double covering tight uh Kyle Pitts in the red zone are you scared of Mike Davis or Cordell Patterson uh, what are you talking about I know Cordell Patterson had a good game this uh this game in London but man oh man you put a second body in Kyle Pitts in the red zone what are you nuts so great touchdown there to get them up to 10 nothing there in the first half Kyle Pitts coming alive here in London I believe this is Wembley this is Wembley Stadium what do we got uh but that's Kyle Pitts out there very well done um all righty yeah just watch this man extend boom 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 good throw too that's a good throw uh not great it's a good throw all right, here we go. Second quarter, third and one, folks. Who do they go to? Who do you trust? You got to trust Kyle Pitts. Look at that great separation right there. Takes about 25-yard gain right there, picking up the first down, keeping the chains moving. And once again, just that separation. That's a yard and a half. And they, oh, my God, a one-handed catch. Oh, oh, one-handed catch out here flexing on them. And they teach that course at Tight End University, the flex course and uh, the stunting course, if you will. 
and that's what Kyle Pitts does. On third and 10, folks, Kyle Pitts comes up a little shy of the first down, unfortunately. But that's fine. That's fine. He'll make it up a little bit later here. Like right here on second and nine. Gets the first down. Keeps the chains moving. And uh, they got a 20-9 to nine lead here in the four, fourth quarter. And they're keeping the clock moving here because Kyle Pitts is picking up the first down. Great job right there. Here we go. Trying to ice the game here. The Jets have made it a game. They've closed the lead down to only a three-point lead here for the Falcons with seven minutes left in the fourth quarter. What do they do here? They go to Kyle Pitts. Deep ball. Deep ball. Wide open. Underthrown by Matt Ryan right here. You put this out in front of him. This is a touchdown, but Kyle Pitts has to slow down. Let's count the yards from this one. He's going to throw from the 20-yard line. Get it all the way down to kind of the 40. Womp. What do we got? Like 40 yards there? Nothing great. I mean, we know you can throw 55 yards. So under throws this ball, but it's Kyle Pitts. He's so wide open. It doesn't matter if you under throw him. He'll go, he'll go up and get it. He went up and got it. First down, keeping the clock moving and making it more difficult. Let's get the kind of all 22 up in here. And let's see Kyle Pitts run this route. Here we go. And, folks, this is a tight end. Look at that. Look at that. Wide open. And like we said, if, you know, you put this ball out in front, he'll catch that for the touchdown and keep going. Second and 12 now, Kyle Pitts, I mean, going up and getting that ball and keeping the drive moving. And I believe they score a touchdown on that drive. Let's quickly double check. They kind of iced the game right there. And they do score a touchdown because of all the big plays of Kyle Pitts there to ice the game. So... An all-around good game by Kyle Pitts, getting out uh, early, putting up the touchdown, and then icing the game. So a true full quarters played here by Kyle Pitts, and very well done. And welcome, because you are getting an A and a crumpet. An A, it's not an A+, plus, it's an A plus a crumpet there. Uh, so coming out in London with the crumpet and the A rating here. Fantastic. Isn't that what they do on the report card? They give you an A and then they send a crumpet in the mail. I believe that's how it goes, folks. So very well done to Kyle Pitts coming out in London. Finally awakening here for this Atlanta offense. Sooner rather than later. Only took him five weeks, but the rookie is here. So well done. Let's give Kyle Pitts an A grade. He also had a C and a B minus. So his highest grade of the season. You gotta love it and you gotta respect it. So for his week five performance, in A. Very well done. Alrighty, the next tight end up here is got to go to, to New England out here, and we got to talk about Hunter Henry. Some big plays here. He was the leading receiver for this Patriots team. Six receptions for 75 yards and a touchdown. And we've got a and we've got some plays queued up here. That we got to show on why this man deserves a big grade here this week. So here we go. First play up here. We're getting fourth quarter touchdown drives. They stalled. They were floundering here in the first half. This Patriots offense was. They weren't really getting it done. Yeah, they scored a touchdown to open up the gate, but then another field goal and another field goal and another field goal. So they were struggling to come away with seven points, but Hunter Henry changed that. So here we go. Second and three here on this fourth quarter touchdown drive. Dumps it off to Hunter Henry, and it gets the first down, picks up the chains, moves the ball so they can capitalize on this touchdown. And these two passes, these two throws to Hunter Henry, this one, and then we've got the next one. We've got the next one. Here we go. These two throws here by Mac Jones were the only two throws on this entire drive, folks. On this entire touchdown drive here in the fourth quarter that went seven plays. Every other play, all five other plays were runs. The two passes were to Hunter Henry here when they were down 22 to 15. So the first one to pick up the first down. And then third and six, Hunter Henry, boom, corner of the end zone. There it is, open, touchdown, ties up the game here to allow them to win the game on the following drive that once again Hunter Henry has a little bit of a role in so let's watch this ball uh, just look at that just out of the outstretched hands of the defender there and Hunter Henry keeps his eyes on the ball 
Mac Jones puts it 100% exactly where it needs to be. We can get a great look right here. I mean, she's right past that man's, that defender's fingertips to bat the ball away. Hunter Henry, touchdown right there to tie up the game. You got to love it, but the man is not done. Now we got a tie game. Now you have to go out and win the game. Here we go. Third and six. Mac Jones. Four minutes left at midfield. Who do you trust on third and six? You trust Hunter Henry. Boom. First down pickup right there. That allows um, that, that allows them to go for the field goal. So once again, this was the last pass of the entire game here by the Patriots after they throw the uh, the, uh after they have the uh, the where is this ten yard pass to Hunter Henry on third and six? They go pass incomplete, so nobody else can pass. Uh, nobody else can catch. Nikhil Harry can't catch. And then twenty four yard run, nine yard run, three yard run, two yard run, five yard penalty, five yard run, one yard run, and then they kick the game winning field goal. Hunter Henry caught the last pass of the game, caught a touchdown, kept the chains moving, and got it done. Especially in the fourth quarter, all those plays were from the fourth quarter, folks. How the heck do I get this down? Um, why is this up? You can, you can, thank you. <laughs> um, but no, here we go. Okay. All these pop-ups coming up. What the heck? We're talking about Hunter Henry. You want to pop up on my screen? What are you doing? Um, so Hunter Henry clutches. Heck, they teach you that at Titan University. Touchdown, moving the ball on that game-winning field goal drive. Hunter Henry has been on this list before last week with the B grade, and he's getting an A grade here at week five. Absolutely well done here by Hunter Henry. And this man is trying to be in the running for best tight end in the league. Uh, who, I don't really know who's kind of out in front. Kyle Pitts has three grades. Grades. That's kind of the only person so far that has three grades. Um, Travis Kelsey, no, Travis Kelsey has three grades, A+, plus, A+, plus, B-, minus. so I would probably say that's out in front, but he's not getting on the list this week, folks, unfortunate. So a lot of ground to make up here, and Hunter Henry is trying his damnedest. Very well done last uh, this week here, Hunter Henry. Touchdown, leading the team in receiving yards. Sheesh, fantastic. Alrighty, the next tight end here that we have to judge, and we're going old school with this one, folks. Respect the OG tight ends. You know, this new school era of tight ends that are going for 100 yards a game, that are leading the teams in receiving yards, a la Travis Kelsey last season, led the entire team in receiving yards. Absolutely fantastic. But this guy, he started in about 2006, folks. He was a little bit old school, where only kind of four to five hundreds was immaculate couple of touchdowns here and there was immaculate not this new age so we got to go to mercedes lewis folks and start giving this man some respect out here because he had some big plays uh in this game so the first play right here is a well let's bring up his stats here we go mercedes lewis he only had two catches for 34 yards. One came on a touchdown drive. We got this play queued up, and then one play helps set up the game-winning field goal. Not one of the game-winning field goals that missed the game-winning field goal. So here we go. First play up here is on their touchdown drive in the second quarter. Aaron Rodgers, play-action pass, and then finds Mercedes Lewis. Look at that. Wide open, getting them down into the red zone. And then goes down at the 10-yard line. Good catch there by Mercedes Lewis. That was one. And that leads to six points there for the Green Bay Packers. And now we got to fast forward his next catch. Like we said, he only had two of them. His next catch comes in over time, folks. So let's get this play queued up. Here we go. Here we go now. Aaron Rodgers from his own 40-yard line. Tie game in overtime. Four minutes left. Play action pass again. He dumps it off to a little bit of a setup screen to Mercedes Lewis. He gets hit four yards after the line of scrimmage. What does he do? He bounces off of it. He gets hit again. Ten yards down the field. What does he do? Bounces off of it. He stays on his feet and takes them all the way down. Delivers one more hit. And here you see this green line right here. That's the field goal line. He put them in position to kick this field goal. It's Mercedes Lewis, folks. Absolutely great. He only had two catches, but every catch was big time, resulting in points, resulting into the game win, and delivering big hits here. This is what the O 
OGs do, folks. Don't get caught up with the new school of Darren Waller and Kyle Pitts and all that. Respect the OGs that have paved the way for these tight ends. That's why Greg Olson is, is also part of tight end university of creating it because he was kind of these OG ones as well. 37-year-old Mercedes Lewis dishing out big old shoulders here, refusing to go down, picks up 20-plus yards right here and gets them right at that field goal range marker for them to kick the game-winning field goal. Well done, Mercedes Lewis. First time on our tight end university list here this season. Mercedes Lewis, we're giving him a solid B plus out here. Very well done. Very well done. This is what we talk about, folks. Getting it done in the clutch. Being that uh, receiver. Being that pass catcher that gets it done. And Mercedes Lewis did it here this week. Very well done. Shout out to 37-year-old. How tall is this man? What do we got? 6'6". Six, six. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Give this man some respect. Get this man another ring. Get this man another ring. I, uh, he might not even have a ring. Did he win a ring with that? Uh, no, he got to Green Bay in 2018. Jacksonville knows him well. So, get this man a ring. He needs a ring. Get that man a ring. All righty. Next tight end up here is... Here we go, Dallas Goddard for the Philadelphia Eagles. All righty, Dallas Goddard. This Eagles team struggled offensively in the first half, but Dallas Goddard, two receptions for 28 yards, and both came on big plays, folks, big plays. So here we go. Let's watch uh, Dallas Goddard here in the fourth quarter getting it done like we said the offense was just slow out of the gate here but on big plays here Dallas Goddard shows up big time so here we go in the fourth quarter shows up big they're down five points 18 to 13 against the Carolina Panthers and they're at the Panthers 25 yard line here we go Dallas Goddard's about to catch a big one here folks Jalen Hurts drops back to pass and there's Dallas Goddard wide open and brings them down to the five yard line folks and then this man has had, an, had a chance to put up a touchdown on the board. They go back to Dallas Goddard right here. Unfortunately, could not complete this ball. Uh, could not complete the catch here. Let's watch it. Here we go. Dallas Goddard. They're going to try and go back to him. Uh, play action pass wide open here down the boundary. Unfortunately, could not catch the ball. And then on the following uh, play, Jalen Hurts says, I'll do it myself and runs it in. So I got to give Dallas Goddard a little credit right here. Obviously would give him a lot more credit here if he caught that ball. But we'll still give Dallas Goddard a little respect right here. Is this his first time on this list? It is. All righty. Nope, nope. It's a second. He got a B plus in week one. We're only going to give him a C here for week five, but he made a – actually, we'll elevate it to C plus. Give him a C plus out here for week five. A big catch right there to bring them inside the red zone, inside the five-yard line, and then they capitalize it. He had a chance to capitalize it himself, which would have been elevated to probably a B plus or maybe even an A minus, but he dropped it. So only a C plus right here. Solid catch right there to allow the game-winning touchdown play. Very well done to Dallas Goddard. All righty, and then, folks, we don't like doing this. We have to do this. We don't like doing it. We don't like giving out Fs, and we've only given out one F so far, and that was week three to Logan Thomas against the Bills when he fumbled the ball in the close game when they were trying to make it a close game. Uh, fumbles the ball real early in the first half, and uh, they're not able to really do anything after that um, or really just be competitive, competitive after that. The Bills kind of blow it open. So we do give out F minuses when they are – Granted, when they are uh, worthy of it, we've only given away one so far, but there was another F-minus performance this week, and it takes us to Jacksonville. And truly unfortunate here, Dan Arnold here of the Jacksonville Jaguars. He led the team in receiving yards, which you would probably say, well, he deserves a B, a B plus, an A minus, but uh, he fumbled on the first drive of the game and resulted into six points the other way. So Dan Arnold, man, oh man, truly getting out of this gate slowly here, and that's exactly what the Jaguars could not afford this game. They were at home. They had the whole Urban Meyer fiasco playing out all week long. They needed to be tipped 
tip-top tip -top shape here. Everything 100% clean. No turnovers. Nothing like that. Good from start to finish. But they got off to a bad start here. And it's all Dan Arnold's fault. So here we go. Third and 10 here. First drive of the game. Trevor Lawrence dropping back the pass. Dumps the ball off to Dan Arnold. About five yards short of the first down. So it wouldn't have picked up the first down. So if Dan Arnold wants to blame this F- minus on Trevor Lawrence, that's fine. But you still have to hold on, hold on to this ball. Catches it. Immediately gets hit. And then it results into six points because they pick it up and run with it and they get into the end zone. I believe that's Demir Bird out there. Well done by the safety. But, um, yeah, Dan Arnold, what the hell? You get out to a slow start. The first pa pass to you is a fumble six. Oh, no. Especially, like we said, when we needed absolute perfection right out of the gate here for this Jaguars team because of Urban Meyer. And Dan Arnold lets the team down. Now, luckily for Dan Arnold, the team, you know, responds with the touchdown. But at that point, you're always playing catch up now because of that points that you squandered. And we see the catch up getting played so they're down six nothing then they score a touchdown making a seven six but then the Titans make it 14-6 and then the Jaguars respond making it 14 to 13 and then they score another touchdown now they're down 21 to 13 and they have to settle for a field goal 24 to 13 and then they score another touchdown 31 to 13 so they were always playing catch up because Dan Arnold fumble sixth the first drive of the game so Dan Arnold an F minus a failing grade we hate them, but we expect perfectness, perfectness, perfection, if you will, here at Tight End University. We are here to elevate and celebrate the tight ends, not get lackluster, trash, game-losing plays. Unfortunate, Dan Arnold is the recipient of the second F-minus of the season. Yikes. Alrighty, now our next tight end that we got to celebrate here. No more Fs for the rest of the day, folks. How great is that? But we have to go to the Browns and Chargers. And man, oh man, these tight ends were getting it done out here. And we, let's start here with the Browns, Baker May or the Browns tight end, David Njoku. Leading receiver here for the Browns. Seven receptions, 149 yards, and one touchdown. He caught every single ball. Seven targets, seven receptions. That's how you get it done. Uh, clutch, consistent from start to finish. And we've got all plays here queued up for it, David and Joku. So let's watch and let's see what play and what grade we can give them. Here we go. First drive of the game, 14 minutes, 0-0 game. They go to David and Joku in the flat, and he picks up about eight, nine yards. And just look at this, folks. Look at this. The hesitation, the move, the able to stay on your feet to pick up the extra yards. Here we go. Just going to push this man down, get down, stays on his feet, and picks up about two or three more yards. So very well done there. That's play one. Play two, here we go. I believe on the same drive, they're at midfield, still 0-0 game in the first quarter. Baker Mayfield escaping out of the pocket and just going to David Njoku, wide open, 15 yards down the field, and that puts them into the, um, uh, what do we got? We got, um, they get them down to the 30-yard line of the Chargers, and uh, unfortunately, this play does result into only three points, but it's David Njoku, a nice drive starter on the first pass getting them down another 15 yards there for the first down fantastic so they get three points but now they're down seven to three on their next drive what does David and Joku do here for this squad let's see here we go first and ten play action pass going to David and Joku again once again drive starters here and he goes all the way down 25 maybe even 30 yards crossing midfield on a crucial drive here now what do they do on this drive it results into a touchdown fantastic they retake the lead because David and Joku is helping them out here on these drive starters getting Baker Mayfield's confidence up getting the defense off balance it's all because of David and Joku that's what the tight ends can do for your team they change the team they change the game that's what they do here we go next play here with David and Joku they're down again 13 to 10 but here we go in the second quarter at the 25 yard line of the Chargers play action pass on first and 10 Baker Mayfield stepping up in the pocket and just dumping it down to 
David Njoku last second here. You really have to zoom in to really see him dump off the ball. You would miss it if you blonk. Here it is. This is when he just tosses it to him. Just toss, a little toss to him. And that's what David Njoku and tight ends do. They're safety blankets. Nothing open. Just toss it to him. And let's see if he can do anything. He couldn't do anything. Got only about a one-yard gain. But he Baker Mayfield had nothing open. And he just literally just kind of tossed it to him. Literally kind of handed it off to him. Uh, about two yards in the backfield. So, well done. David Njoku just being that safety blanket drive starter safety blanket uh, touchdown catcher that we have yet to see but with that is coming up folks so here we go next play I think I gotta stay on this one here we go I think we gotta go to two plays later here All right, here we go. On third down and seven, I believe they go back to David and Joku here. Let's see if my notes are right. Here we go. Third and seven. Knocking on the door of the red zone at the 22-yard line here. The Chargers on third and seven, down three. What can they do? Baker Mayfield goes to David and Joku, and he's about one yard short of the first down. Unfortunate. Uh, Baker Mayfield, you know, dumped it down to him. And uh, it brings up a fourth down, and they go for it. Uh, we know Kevin Stefanski goes for it a lot on third down, fourth and one, and all that. Fourth downs, really, we should have said first. <laughs> but uh, they go for it on fourth and two, and Baker Mayfield couldn't connect with OBJ. Real bad job catching the ball by OBJ there. Really was should have been caught. But that's what Hunter Henry does, or David Njoku does, gets you down so you can go for it on a fourth down. Fantastic there, once again, by David Njoku. And they didn't even have David Njoku out on the play for fourth and two there. Unfortunate, you probably should have. All righty, now here we go. In the fourth quarter when it was getting crazy. David Njoku wanted a part of the craziness here in the fourth quarter. So let's watch him be a little crazy right here. Browns down 1.28 to 27. But it's there. It's there. David Njoku. Boom. Boom. Off and riding fast. Tight ends, folks. Tight ends are fast. Tight ends are tall. Tight ends are strong, folks. They're everything nowadays. And they're especially fast. Did we mention fast? Because we saw some speed right here here we go second and three let's watch this one one more time Baker Mayfield dumps it off to him David and Joku in the middle of the field wide open great job of getting open here and then he takes it throw uh, shakes off this tackle right there and then it's a foot race for 55 yards and nobody can catch the big strong fast tight ends out here David and Joku touchdown baby retaking the lead in the fourth quarter that's what tight ends do folks that's what tight ends do and we're not done yet we're not done yet we've still got more plays one more play here last ditch effort 41 seconds left no timeouts down five got to do something and tight ends are right there with you battling to the very last uh, second they pick up 10 yards it's still in bounds but that's what uh, Baker Mayfield throw to and David and Joku will always catch everything Baker Mayfield throws to him there it is the pickup of the first down unfortunately they got to clock the ball doesn't result in anything, but it's David Njoku all game long. Drive starters, touchdown, home run hitters. It's David Njoku, folks. All righty. Is David Njoku, is this man, I believe this is his first time on our list here. Very well done and welcome to Tight End University, David Njoku. Let's get this man's grade up here, and we're going to give him an A performance. David Njoku. A minus for week five. Absolutely fantastic. They win the game. I probably bump it up to an A. Probably. Um, unfortunate there. But uh, very well done by David and Joku. Fantastic. Alrighty, our next tight end here is in the same game. Chargers, Browns. This time. On the Charger side, we got to go to, and you know, it was something small, nothing great here, but Donald Parham 
two receptions, 29 yards, and a touchdown. And the touchdown came on their first touchdown of the game. So nice job to kind of get some points here for your team. They're down three to se- uh, three to nothing. So you go out and take the lead. So here we go, second and seven here at the Browns 23-yard line. Play action pass here by the Chargers and David Parham wide open here at the 20-yard line. Going to take it all the way down, staying in bounds, quick cutting, weaving in and out there. And then look at this man just go right down the sideline for the touchdown. Fantastic here. Smart plays here by the tight ends, folks. They have high level IQ. Staying in bounds. Doesn't kind of cut inside. Doesn't just walk out of bounds. Tiptoes the out of bounds line. Stays on his feet and dives for the end zone. Touchdown, David Parham. Very well done. That's really all he did all game. But it was very well done, and it got them off to a good start here. We'll give that a little great. It's only going to be a C, nothing great, but it was good. It was good for when it was, and they resulted into a win overall. So you give the man credit. We'll give him a C for his Week 5 performance. Very well done. David Parham finally getting on the tight end university list. All righty, what do we got? A couple more here. A couple more tight ends to go over. Next tight end up is uh, one that's really starting to emerge as real, real solid, reliable, always. He's found himself on this list multiple times. One time, two times. What do we got? What do we got? Uh, twice already with an A- minus and an A-. minus. Sheesh, sheesh. That's what we're talking about. And is it the last two weeks? Weeks three and four. Oh, three straight weeks on this board, folks. Give this man some credit. Give this man some mother loving credit. We got to go to the Giants Cowboys game and respect Dalton Schultz, folks. Woof. Uh, great game right here by Dalton Schultz. He's really kind of getting into the re- like top receiving yards here, kind of on a weekly basis right here. He was the second leading receiver for this Cowboys team. Six catches for 79 yards. No touchdowns, but he helped set up a ton of points here. A lot of uh, kind of two touchdowns here in the game. So we've got uh, the first one queued up here. They're going to this man three straight times, I believe, right here. Three straight times. So here we go. It's a tie game, 10-10 right here. They're at their own 23-yard line, the Cowboys are. They go to Dalton Schultz right over the middle of the field. Fantastic. Then the next play, we got to go same drive here. But just a little bit down the field, and uh, down a little bit here in the drive here. So a good job there. A little dink and dunk to pick up the first down to Dalton Schultz. A nice little kind of drive starter, if you will. And now we get a third and four at the Giants' 40-yard line. Dalton Schultz, boom, right down the middle of the field. Wide open, bringing them down to the 25-yard line. And it results into a touchdown. Yeah, I think they go to him again here on this play. Here we go. Next play up, very next play, going to Dalton Schultz again. No, that wasn't it. All right. Uh, But it results into a touchdown right here, and uh, they are able to retake the lead 17-10 because Dalton Schultz uh, multiple times on this drive. Very well done. And then we get another touchdown drive here in the third quarter. They're up 17-13, to 13, looking to kind of put away the game here or at least kind of extend the game, extend the lead here. They're up four, third and six. Who do they trust? Who do they go to? You know it's the tight ends here. Here we go. Dalton Schultz. Open. Carson, uh, Dak Prescott buying time, b- uh, rolling out to the right, throwing 15 yards down the field, and that's Dalton Schultz, baby. Buying time. Dak Prescott keeping his eyes down the field. Dalton Schultz keeping the play alive. Wide open. Look at that. Nice yard of separation right there, right on the money. And this drive also results into a touchdown. So on third down, drive starters, all that. That's what Dalton Schultz does. So not as good as his last two performances. His last two weeks performances but he's still a huge piece offensively for this Cowboys team and we're going to give him a solid B minus here for this week five performance drives helping drives that result in the touchdowns folks that's what the tight ends are there for fantastic Alrighty, next tight end up here is going to be the Bills tight end at Dawson Knox, folks. Woof, woof. Man, oh, man, he had two big old plays right here. 
Um, Dawson Knox, I believe, was the leading receiver here for the Bills. He only had three catches, but it went for 117 yards. He scored a touchdown as well. So... Let's watch. Uh, we've got the two plays queued up here. The two big plays here by Dawson Knox. The first one is. Let me get it queued up here, folks. Hang on. Here we go. Here we go. First half. Nope. Third quarter. Hang on. When did this touchdown come? I forgot to put which one was the one I was supposed to do first. I apologize. Um. Was it the touchdown that came first? Or was it the just big play that came first? I think it was the touchdown that came first. All right, touchdown that came first. Let's watch the touchdown first. We'll watch these in order. Here we go. First, Dawson Knox, big catch of the game here. Bales up 17-10 to 10 in the second quarter. They're at their own 45-yard line. Josh Allen escapes out of the pocket, rolling out to the right and flings it down the field. And that's Dawson Knox wide open. Five yards of separation between him and the next defender. And he's only got 10 more yards to run. Wide open. Touchdown. Bingo, bango. Dawson Knox extending the lead to 24-10. to 10, Kind of closing out the door. That's exactly what we wanted to see out of the Bills. And Dawson Knox was helping doing that fantastic and then Dawson Knox here another big play unfortunately this results into a punt they have this big 41 yard pickup the next three plays don't result to a first down they have to punt this ball here but it's still Dawson Knox showing out here for his squad uh, always reliable always at the ready here we go Josh Allen flinging this ball from his own 10 yard line all the way down to the 45 of the Kansas City Chiefs and it's Dawson Knox making this big old grab right here look at this man boom kind of of a 50-50 ball, but it's Dawson Knox, the big tight end there, going up and catching this ball over the defender. And that's Dawson Knox, baby. Leading receiver for the Bills on two plays, basically. So, Dawson Knox, real solid there with the touchdown to extend the lead, and we're going to give him a solid A-. minus. I don't believe this is Dawson Knox's first time on this list, is it? I think we've got him up here before somewhere. Yeah, here we go. We have an A minus week three, an A minus week four, and an A minus week five. Absolutely fantastic. It's just he doesn't really kind of have like an eight receiving kind of game. It's always kind of big plays, like a touchdown, like three or four catches that always go big. But, hey, it's doing exactly what he needs to be doing. They're getting wins. They're moving the ball. They're putting out the points. Dawson Knox, third week in a row with an A minus. Very well done. All right, and then we've got two more to go over here. The first one is going to be Tyler Higby. And we've got one big play from him. Uh, the, Matthew Stafford missed him on this play last week, but made it up to him this week. So here we go. Tyler Higby, nothing really great here, but he scored a touchdown and it helped extend the lead. So we're going to give him a little bit of a shout out here. But Tyler Higby, only two catches for 14 yards, and this catch went for 13 yards. So here it is, folks. The big play by Tyler Higby, third quarter. Rams only up two points here, 9-7. to seven. Matthew Stafford at the 13-yard line, going to deliver a great ball here to Tyler Tyler Higby at the back of the end zone, and it's Tyler Higby catching this ball. Like I said, Matthew Stafford overthrew Tyler Higby last week for the touchdown, but made for, made up for it this weekend. This lead, this touchdown helps them kind of get the lead, open up the lead a little bit more, and ultimately win the game. So Tyler Higby, not his first time on this list either. He's got a C plus and an A minus, and we're just gonna give him a nice B, B minus for week five. Very well done, Tyler Higby. And then the last tight end to go over, folks. Sheesh, the best tight end performance of the entire year, folks. Of the entire year. Just last night, Mark Andrews, 11 receptions, 147 yards, two touchdowns, two extra two-point conversions, folks. Clutch as heck. So let's watch the best plays of Mark Andrews, folks. And let's see what grade we can give him. 
here we go. Here we go. Mark Andrews. Boom. Five yard completion right there. First quarter. Boom. Reliable. Able to kind of help move the ball here. We know they struggled offensively as a team, but not Mark Andrews. Here we go. Back in the first quarter. Boom. Second and nine. First down and more and more. Look at that vision he has. He's just roll, running all across the field right there to find the open spots. You got to love it. Here we go. Second and three. They're going to go deep, deep. Mark Andrews on the boundary. Boom. Perfect. Uh, perfectly thrown by ball by Lamar Jackson. It's Mark Andrews. Well done to get wide open there on the right sideline. All righty. Here we go. Lamar Jackson, third quarter, buys time, boom, Mark Andrews right there to pick up eight yards on first and ten, moving the ball, boom, Mark Andrews always there, pressure filled with Lamar Jackson, he dumps out to Mar uh, Mark Andrews, here we go, boom, again, over the middle of the field on second and seven, Mark Andrews, boom, getting them to midfield, and now we are starting to get into the drives that de decided this game, the clutch drives that needed to be absolutely perfected uh, for Flawlessly. Look at this one-handed, absolutely great grab by Mark Andrews. Sheesh on first and 10 to get him to midfield. Next play. Going to Mark Andrews again. Boom. Out of the backfield. And whoop. Doing a little whoop. Get it, making that man miss. Making somebody else miss. And picking up 15 yards. Now down in the red zone at the five-yard line. They need a touchdown here. Who do you rely on? Mark Andrews, folks. Woof. Dancing. Lamar Jackson in the backfield. Plenty of time in. Mark Andrews works his way to the front of the end zone. That's a touchdown. Boom. And now who do you trust on the two-point conversion? You need this. You don't get this. The game is over. Mark Andrews. Boom. Wide open. Little stunt with the ball celebrating before he gets into the end zone. That's how wide open he was. Two-point conversion is good by the Ravens. And now we get down back into the red zone. They need a touchdown here. Who do you trust? Of course, Mark Andrews. Boom. Low and away. Extends the ball over the goal line. Boom. Touchdown, Mark Andrews. And who do you trust on the two-point conversion? Oh, we trust it. Oh, you're in the two-point conversion. You got to trust somebody, right? Here we go. It's Mark Andrews again. Five wide. Lamar Jackson. Boom. Dumps it off to Mark Andrews quickly. And that's two two-point conversions, two clutch touchdowns by Mark Andrews. Give this man respect, and he showed up in overtime, folks. It wasn't for the touchdown, but on second and four, Mark Andrews picks up 15, 20 yards right there, gets the ball over midfield. Mark Andrews, the best performance by a tight end this season. We have given out an A++ to CJ Uzma, but this is better than that. This is better than that. The first ever A++++, plus, 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 folks, for his week five performance. That is the new bar. That is the new best performance we have ever seen by a tight end. Shout out to Mark Andrews. Shout out to tight end university. A++++. Plus, 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 the first of the season, folks. And I don't know anybody that's topping that. Best performance by a tight end through, week, through five weeks. And I think this is going to be the best performance of the entire season. Mark Andrews representing the tight ends. Representing tight end university. Because that's what tight ends do, baby. Clutch, 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 clutch. You can rely on them. That's what they do. Tight end university. Tight ends unite. Pay the tight ends. Give their tight ends some respect out here. Sheesh. All righty. Now we've got to finish off the show. Still going to go late today. Jeez Louise. But we've got to do our power rankings. All right. Week five is officially in the books here. So we have to reorder these teams. Who is moving up and who is moving down. We've already moved the Bills already. They were at number six heading into this week. And we just had to move them to number three. That's where they're going to stay. But very well done for the Bills. Uh, had to move them up because we didn't really buy them 100%. We didn't think they were going to win the Chiefs game so come Monday yesterday on the show we just had to do it it was too urgent for us not to do it so well done to the Bills at number three all right, so let's start here at number 10. And we have a new team here in the top 10. Shout out this team. All right, hang on. Let's uh, remind you all what the, the top 10 was heading into this week. So we had Packers at 10, Chargers at 9, Ravens at 8, Browns at 7, Rams at 6, Bucks at 5, Chiefs at 4, Bills at uh, 3. Now they were at 6. Uh, we switched the Rams and the Bills. So the Bills were at 6, the Bucks were at 5, the Chiefs were at 4, the Rams were at 3, the Cowboys were at 2, the Cardinals are at number 1. And we just moved the Bills to number three. 
the Rams, we will move them up. Don't worry, they will not be at number six. Or will they? Stick around to find out. Here we go. New number 10 team in this league and a new team on this list. First time of the season here on this list. We're going to go the Tennessee Titans. Man, oh, man, they've got it going on. They're just running Derrick Henry, running Derrick Henry 29 to 33 times a game, and they're getting great production out of him. Ryan Tannehill being that game manager that he is. Julio Jones didn't go two weeks ago, a little banged up, didn't go this week, banged up, and they are still having no problem here. And, folks, their number one receiver last week, can you guess his? name like we said it's not Julio Jones he didn't play it wasn't even AJ Brown it was Marcus Johnson they're finding ways besides their main players their main receivers to get it done um, they're just running the ball and letting Ryan Tannehill game manage and the defense is getting some nice takeaways some nice turnovers and this Titans team is slowly starting to build upon one of the be being one of the better teams in this league they still have a way to go I mean truly the gap between numbers one through five in our power rankings and then five through ten it is still a big gap right there so the titans still have their way if they want to try to even crack the top five but their running game derrick henry's going crazy uh they're three and two they're winning games they're coming back from behind they're putting together full quarters of football together good good play good level of play so we're gonna move the titans to number 10 very well done keep it up derrick henry absolutely love it Alrighty, our new number nine team here. We're going to move the Packers up one spot up here. Alrighty, the game against the Bengals, it kind of went exactly like we thought it would. We didn't think the Packers were going to blow out the Bengals. We had the we took the Bengals plus three, and they should have won, but all those missed field goals, I mean, it was really, it was basically a tie game. These were evenly matched teams, but we're going to move the Packers up one spot here uh, just because of how everybody else has been doing this week. Uh, the Packers, they're Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams. Devontae Adams, 200 yards receiving, absolutely going crazy. And it's just, you know, it's just, um, you know, Aaron Rodgers, what he does. He did throw an interception early on in that game, but he kind of, you know, put it in the back of his mind and showed out for the rest of the game. So this Packers team is good. Um, like I said, I think they're kind of, you know, five through 10. I don't think they're ready to crack that kind of next leap um, to crack the top five because there is a big gap. Like we said, between, uh, between five and six, there's a big gap, truly. That's really where it separates. So if you're in the top five, you're elite. If you're five through ten, you're kind of second tier-ish, um, which is still good. It's still winning games and looking good, but that's what the Packers are. They're just Aaron Rodgers. Uh, they're not doing anything great. They haven't had a big win. They've had a lackluster loss, all of that stuff. So we're going to keep them at number nine here, taking it slowly week by week here with the Packers until they just show us something great consistently. I want to see some blowouts here by Aaron Rodgers, you know, how Aaron Rodgers is great and, you know, he's not having anything great here passing you know one of the best quarterbacks in the league but we just haven't really seen a great game flawless game by this Packers team yet so we'll leave them at number nine all right number eight we are going to leave nope we're going to go Browns at number eight. They're going to drop back a spot right here. Just once again, that clutch ability. Baker Mayfield just does not have it. And uh, this team a little bit, unfortunately, lost the game. Now, they put up 42 points. So it's still the offense was great. Baker Mayfield did exactly what we needed to do. But this Browns team winning those close games against good teams, against the Chiefs last year in the playoffs, just could not pull through this week against the Chargers, a real solid team, you know, going freaking tit for tat in the fourth quarter. But just just unfortunately uh, just couldn't get it done the defense gives up a touchdown there's no time to kind of respond they're down five and they can't get it going so we're gonna move the Browns down one spot here and it's really not even because of what they did it's just because we have to move the Ravens up one spot folks so the Browns would have stayed at number seven if the Ravens lost last night but they ended up winning coming back from behind and that was a holy cow performance so no real fault to the Browns being down to number eight here, but this team is still great. Kevin Stefanski, uh, you know, usually really solid play calling. Had a little bit of a hiccup there in the fourth quarter. But for the most part, it's fine. Uh, the defense, you know, a little bit of a hiccup here, giving up 40-plus points, that explosive fourth quarter, all that. And then the running game, fantastic here for the Browns. The offense, usually fantastic here for the Browns. They do need Jarvis Landry back. But uh, overall, this Browns team is still very, very good, explosive. They can move the ball. They can stop their opponents from moving the ball. They can win games. Browns just have to move down a spot because our new number seven team, like we just said, is the Ravens. And man, oh, man, it's Lamar Jackson, folks. This defense... 
This Ravens defense got it done when they needed to. Blocked that uh, field goal. Fantastic. Uh, caused a takeaway by Carson Wentz, even though the offense couldn't do anything with it. Uh, the one thing that we, the reason why we can't move this Ravens team up a little bit more here is that we were seeing Lamar Jackson still turning the ball over at bad times. Yes, he's making up for it. And yes, he's still winning the games, even though the turnovers against the Chiefs, against here with the Colts here fumbling on the goal line. But it is still cause for concern here. And we have to see him kind of start to clean it up more. We've got to see some consistency of him not turning the ball over but you know when it's crunch time when it's in the clutch when it's go down to win the game time he does it we just saw last night so that's why we have to move him up one spot but this offense is all Lamar Jackson Mark Andrews showing out um you know you um Marquise Brown having good success after that big drop performance a couple of weeks ago. So this Ravens team is seeming to get better every single week. I just need Lamar Jackson to clean up the turnovers. I know he's kind of, uh, you know, cleaning it up himself in the in the sense of, hey, we're not losing the game because of my turnovers and I'm still putting up the points. So that's great. But we I need turnover free football. We just saw what happens when you turn the ball over in the playoffs last year. Lamar Jackson end zone with the Bills throws a pick six game over. So Ravens at seven. We will take it slowly but surely but this team is man a man it's explosive with Lamar Jackson all right new number six team we're gonna move this up uh this team up a little bit more we're gonna go the Chargers here at number six uh well done to going toe for toe shot for shot with the Browns there in the fourth quarter that's what Justin Herbert does Brandon Stanley you know great aggressive play caller this Chargers defense real solid um obviously you know giving up 42 points is never great but that Browns offense is the real deal in this Chargers team just never gave up and uh, they did exactly what they needed to to beat that Browns team so really six seven and eight here really just kind of decided by an inch right here and uh, we'll see what they do progressing moving forward all right number five is gonna remain the bucks all right they blew out the dolphins congratulations that bucks offense is exactly like we know it is absolutely fantastic um, you know, Tom Brady, Antonio Brown, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, Leonard Fournette is really the biggest surprise here of this Bucks offense of how much he's getting the ball and carrying it and how well he's utilizing all those touches. And that's probably why they keep on having him as kind of the number one running back. Last year was Ronald Jones as the number one. Leonard Fournette not getting a lot of burn last year, but getting a ton of burn this year and making the most of it. So uh, get, shout out to Leonard Fournette. This Bucks offense is exactly what it is. A little hiccup last week against the Patriots defense but he took advantage and took his uh, frustration out on the Dolphins defense this week Bucks at number five Alrighty, new number four team. Chiefs are no longer even in the top ten. I took them out, folks. I threw them in the trash. All those turnovers, folks. What the hell is up with this Chiefs team? They've, they've never had this many turnovers over and over and over again. Like the last like three weeks, big turnovers. Now last week they scored a touchdown on every single drive, and we loved it. But he still threw an interception. And now this week we had four turnovers again, and that really cost them the game against the Bills. So I'm moving the Chiefs out of the top ten. When they clean up their act, we can remove them. I'm in the top 10, but we're going to take it slowly but surely. Patrick Mahomes is really going to have to earn his kind of smurf ability quarterback play. Uh, have to earn that back a little bit because now it's just looking careless and now it's not looking good because it's not resulting in the win. So Chiefs are out of the top 10. Clean up the turnovers. What the hell is that? So the new number uh, three, number four team here is going to be the Rams. All right, little, you know, lackluster play a little bit for the last kind of game and a half here Thursday night against the Seahawks, a little bit lackluster in the first half, but cleaned it up in the second half, which was great, but we're a little concerned overall in some spotty offensive play by Matthew Stafford not getting it done in the clutch. We've seen the Bills get it done in the clutch, the Cowboys get it done in the clutch, the Cardinals get it done in the clutch. We have not seen the Rams really kind of do that yet this season, and I think the play calling gets a little conservative, and Matthew Stafford gets a little inaccurate here. He needs to shore up all those things, and then we could buy the Rams team a little bit more, but we got to move up the Bills. That's why the Bills are at number three. They're absolutely fantastic. They are who everybody thought they were. Shame on us. We are the clowns for not truly believing in this team. Um, you know, we believed in the defense. We never wavered on the defense. This defense is absolutely fantastic, forcing all those takeaways against the Chiefs and all the takeaways just in general of the season. This defense is truly helping the offense tremendously. We just haven't seen that level of play by Josh Allen in the completion percentage game. He got it done last uh, this week against the Chiefs, which was absolutely fantastic. So the Bills at number three. Cowboys are staying number two. Cardinals are staying number one. Cowboys, Dak Prescott, Zeke Elliott, Tony Pollard, uh, Micah Parsons. 
uh, Trayvon Diggs. I mean, folks, they've they're star studded all over the field, offensively, defensively, ball hawks everywhere, first forcing turnovers. Dak Prescott, you know, winning the game with his arm, or just kind of just being the game manager. He can do it both ways because the backfield of Tony Pollard and Ezekiel Elliott is so freaking immaculate here. It's almost absurd. I did not think it was going to be that great uh, this year, but it is, and it's absolutely fantastic. So Cowboys stay at number two. Defense is great, and then the Cardinals are staying at number one. Little lackluster performance last week against the 49ers, but that's a division rival with the best division in the in the in the NFL. So I'm not even going to say it. Well, I'm not even going to knock this team for only winning by seven, and you know the offense being a little lackluster. This team has won every single way. Close dog fights, coming back from behind, blowout is against the Rams. This team has won every single way through the first five weeks. So they're set up for the rest of the season, folks. This Chiefs team can't really overcome all those turnovers. Um, that's you know this Bills team. We haven't seen them get down big, get down bad. Can they respond? Can they get back into it. The Ravens, they've gotten back into it. They're starting to win, you know, while turning over the ball. But for some of these teams that haven't won in certain situations yet, you know, that's going to be kind of their test as the season progresses. The Cardinals have gotten all their tests out of the way, and now they're just playing great football. They're winning football games, and that's a, that's the only thing that matters here. Kyler Murray doing what he does Passing the ball, dual threat ability quarterback, the defense, holding Trey Lance to really nothing. 49ers only scored 10 points all game. So Cardinals are doing what they need to do. Shut out the Ram- or shut down the Rams at home two weeks ago. Shut down another devo- division opponent this week. So the Cardinals stay at number one. So our top 10 heading into week 6 is Titans at six, uh, Titans at 10, Packers at 9, Browns at 8, Ravens at 7, Chargers at 6, Bucks at 5, Rams at 4, Bills at 3, Cowboys at 2, and Cardinals at 1. Ravens clean up the turnovers a little bit with Lamar Jackson. We'll move them up to 6 and maybe even number 5. All righty, folks, that's going to do it for us today. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We are back live tomorrow, noon Eastern, uh, with our Wednesday film study, our favorite day of the week, folks. Sheesh, cannot wait. So we'll go a little bit depth, a little bit more in depth into some more interesting narratives and plays and players and all that in our Wednesday film study. And it's our last week talking about week five before we start talking about week six. So, all righty, folks, we're back tomorrow, live, noon Eastern. Join us. You will not regret it. I promise. We're out of here, folks.